Hello and good evening from my side. Um, a very warm, warm welcome for today's So Advanced. I'm happy to have you here and welcome you um, from my heart in the pop-up house of Switzerland. Let me allow you four to five sentences of who I am and who we are and where you are. So my name is Britta Thiele Klapproth. I am the head of the Swiss Business Hub Germany based in Stuttgart. And um, what do we do in this Swiss Business Hub? We mainly do export promotion and location promotion. That means that we are here for the Swiss SMEs who want to enter the German market and um, are looking for partners, customers, clients, market information, etc. And on the other hand, we guide the German companies who have a deeper interest in Switzerland entrepreneurial side and guide them to the country and provide them with information. So, um, where are you today and where, um, where are we? You are in the pop-up house of Switzerland, being in Stuttgart for four months, and I want to give you an inside view, and if I speak of we and us, I'm talking about the Federal Department of Foreign Affairs, um, in particularly Présence Suisse, Présence Schweiz. This is the agency for the Landeskommunikation abroad and the partners. Um, the partners here in the house are Switzerland Tourism, as you can find the Tourism Lounge in the first floor, and Switzerland Global Enterprise, um, which is the official export promotion agency, and um, I work very close with them. So why did we create and realize this house in the midst of a pandemic um, and very well aware about the fourth wave going to hit us and um, coming, coming closer. So we are, um, I would call us, very courageous partners during Corona. And we see in our everyday life how strong and tight the relations between Baden-Württemberg and Switzerland are. We see um, that people are longing to meet again in person. And we see that, and this is my personal favorite claim, innovation through cooperation might be the growing field in the next decade. And we want to enable you to meet each other, we want to strengthen the exchange, and we wanted to create a place for interactions. Plus, we want to inform you about Switzerland, and we brought facts and figures you might not know today, but maybe in an hour. The team here in the house orchestrated more than 80 events in the field of technology, tourism, AI, um, and today, so advanced. And before I hand over the mic to um, the general secretary, Mr. Marco Seiler, um, I am very honored um, that he is here with us tonight. Um, I might explain you why we do all this in English because we have a joint event with my colleagues from the Swiss Business Hub USA. So that means that we have, via our streaming platform, various American investors looking for information about So Advanced. And I want to take the opportunity um, to say hello to the onliners and um, say a very big thank you to our, um, to our colleagues and from the Swiss Business Hub USA, mainly Sophie, um, based in Boston. So, and I wish all of us a very informative evening. Mr. Marco Seiler, I am done with my entry sentence and I would love to hand over the mic to you. Thank you for being with us and I'm looking forward to So Advanced. Thank you. Thank you so much, Britta. Ladies and gentlemen, here in Stuttgart and online, also in the United States, thank you for joining us. And thanks for your interest in Switzerland and Swiss business. It's a pleasure for me 
to be here in Stuttgart. It's a long time ago. I was last time here doing sports. Um, don't want to go further in details, um, but I have very nice memories of Stuttgart. Um, today, a, a Swiss, a big Swiss newspaper um, um, had a, a big article about the relations between Switzerland and Baden-Württemberg. And the headline was, uh, Ziemlich beste Freunde, very good friends, which is true. And uh, that has to do with geography. Um, the world is changing fast and everything changes and innovation and so on and you will see. Uh, but some, there's something you can't change, that's geography. If you talk security policy, but also economic trade, geography always matters and um, we're neighbors and we will stay neighbors and so it's good to be here. Uh, now, uh, basically, I'm supposed to tell you something about um, how good Switzerland is for business. So I stop here with uh, some of my personal considerations and again, want to just welcome you to this event. What does mean uh, so advanced in terms of Switzerland? It means that thanks to some of our traditional watch MEM and medtech industries, we have or still are a highly industrialized country with highly industrialized precision clusters that we have developed in Switzerland that are still, still there. That allows us to occupy a leading position in the field of advanced production processes also in the digital age. As a production location, Switzerland allows companies to optimize their manufacturing processes by increasing efficiency and saving costs. Smart production takes advantage of high-tech breakthroughs. Various international companies such as Hamilton, we are very happy to have them here, live on stage tonight. ABB, Ehrlichon and Schindler are optimizing their existing production processes with digital solutions in Switzerland. And let me here just tell you two short anecdotes. Schindler, you know, this is a company, among others, building elevators. And some, someone just once told me it's fascinating for him that Switzerland developed one of the biggest elevator companies in the world and it started when Switzerland had no high buildings, no skyscrapers. So how can you succeed as an elevator company if you don't even have a building where you can test the thing? So that's, that's one of the miracles. And also when, when we talk about Hamilton, my, my master, my boss, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, he uh, visited Hamilton in uh, Bonaduz a couple of weeks ago because they're also very important when it comes to fighting uh, Corona. So um, many, many things and stories to tell. And uh, maybe a last uh, thing is our dual education system. And if I talk also to our American friends, I recall our former ambassador or the US, the former US ambassador to Switzerland, Levine. She was also very interested in, in our dual education system, which is probably among the best uh, or the most important uh, factors and elements why we are quite uh, successful when it comes to offer interesting uh, places uh, for doing business, highly qualified and skilled people. So Switzerland is particularly well positioned to address these new challenges of our times many companies face when it comes to keeping the supply chain intact. We have repeatedly proven strong and resilient amidst global crises. Companies not only profit from a stable and low risk environment, but also from a brand that has been consistently linked to high quality, technological superiority and trust made in Switzerland. There was a, an Argentinian minister who recently told her, population that, well, they might, might, there might be some problem in Argentina, but maybe Switzerland w is doing better, but it's, it's langweilig. <laughs> it's boring. 
But you know, um, that also means that it's reliable and stable. And that's something that is very good if you want to do business. And that's what we stand for. With these words, I wish you an informative, fruitful panel discussion, a nice evening, and again, uh, enjoy our pop-up house of Switzerland. Thank you very much. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, also a very warm welcome from my side. My name is Raymond Krohn. I'm the CEO of Switzerland Innovation, the co-host of this evening. I would very briefly thank uh, Britta, Claudia and the whole team of the Swiss Business Hub here in, in Stuttgart, as well as Sophie. Sophie is working for the Swiss Business Hub in the United States. She is representing Switzerland Innovation in the United States. And uh, Sophie, Britta and Claudia had the great idea to do this event uh, jointly, uh, live here in Stuttgart and via uh, a streaming in the US. This proves that also in times where we have to deal with travel restrictions uh, due to COVID, we are able to communicate, we are able to present uh, Switzerland as an innovation for, as a local for innovation, sorry, uh, via digital means. Thank you very much for, for this great idea and thank you very much for setting up uh, this event tonight. I will later on provide you with some background information about Switzerland innovation and now enjoy the evening. Thank you very much. I just have to mark, yes. Then I think it's time now for me to introduce myself and say first thank you. Uh, thank you, Raymond Krohn, thank you, Markus Seiler, Britta, for this very great opening here of the event. And a very warm welcome from my side as well. Nice to have you here. Welcome also to our online audience. My name is Anja Lange. I'm a freelance moderator here from Stuttgart. And I'm very happy that I can be guiding through a lot of panels here in the House of Switzerland. I feel like I live here at the moment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I am here a lot. Um, actually, I dance some Swiss traditional dances here on Saturday, so that was a new one. But usually I'm presenting panels here. I'm very happy to do this tonight as well. So we will have two short presentations here tonight and two short panels talking obviously about tech. That's our headline today, Tech Talks. We will talking about smart factories, about additive manufacturing. And I'm very happy then that I can introduce to you the speakers in a second. But first, we will start with our first presentation here on stage. And it is from Dr. Martin Frey, the CEO of Hamilton. It was just already um, mentioned. And he has been uh, with Hamilton since 12 years. And in this time, the company has grew rapidly yeah, from 350 employees up to 1,500 now. So very big step in that time that he was there. And actually, he studied here in Baden-Württemberg, but also in Zurich. And now he is here and he will let us know what sets the Hamilton Group apart from other companies. So please give him a big applause and welcome Dr. Martin Frey. Yeah, thank you very much for this nice introduction. Um, maybe I have to, to, to also tell, uh, for those who know Andreas Wieland, who is the CEO of Hamilton, uh, I'm the vice CEO and Andreas Wieling. <laughs> hmm? Yeah, 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 almost CEO, vice CEO. Yeah, it's, it's, it's Andreas Wieland is still in power, but he's about to retire, and in, in two or three months from now, you're right. So. Uh, <laughs> Just for those who know Andreas Wieland, he's not gone, he's still here. Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks for this introduction and thanks for inviting me here and for the opportunity to tell something about Hamilton. Uh, well, something about me, I, I'm not Swiss. Uh, maybe if we would talk in German, you, you can realize quicker. Uh, I come basically close from here. Uh, I'm happy to be here, back to the Ländle, Hauptstadt of the Ländle. Uh, and and I'm, I grew up in Heilbronn. Uh, and then it 
pulled me to Switzerland. Uh, I have to be honest, it was not Hamilton that pulled me to Switzerland, it was the mountains. <laughs> it was the mountains, the nature. That was the starting that I looked, uh, I, that would be a very nice to, to live and work. Uh, and now finally, 12 years ago, I, I got the chance to join Hamilton and now I, I think I, I will stay there. Um, I have the button. Yeah, I want to uh, at first introduce something about Hamilton, the company, because we are, have nothing to do with the watches. We have nothing to do with Formula One, but we still are called Hamilton. Uh, and it's right, just uh, two years ago it started with COVID, and that was where the name Hamilton became more, in, came more to the public. Before that, uh, the name was just known for watches in Formula One. Uh, but also we are called Hamilton, and Hamilton comes originally from the US. It was founded in 1950 in California, uh, and then later on it moved on to Reno in Nevada. And the site in Switzerland, it, it's called in Barnadutz. Most people don't know where that is. It's close to Chur uh, in, in Grissen, Graubünden. Uh, and that was founded in 1968, initially as a, as a local production hub and, and distribution hub for Europe. But then it grew rapidly. So most of the innovation came out of Barnardus of Switzerland uh, and was later on transferred uh, to Reno in the US. Uh, now we are uh, on both sides, we have great innovation and production, but really the core or the heart or the, the, the initial seed of, of, of Hamilton and the technology that we launched was in many cases out of Switzerland. Uh, today we have more production sites. One is in Boston uh, and one is in Timisoara in Romania. But the two main headquarters, which are on equal level, is one in, in Reno, and the second headquarter is in Switzerland, uh, close to uh, Coor. Well, this is the founder, Clark Hamilton, who founded the company in 1950. He had a great idea how to make uh, glass syringes uh, with, for very, very low volumes, uh, how to produce it without breaking the glass, and that made the starting point of the success of the company. Unfortunately, Clark uh, passed away pretty early in his life and he handed over to Steve Hamilton, who is today the CEO of Hamilton Company, uh, still. Uh, and then, but then we have already have the third generation. Uh, here, a pretty young picture uh, of those. On the left side, it's Matthew Hamilton. He is now vice CEO of Hamilton Company in the US. In the middle, it's Bob Hamilton, CEO of Hamilton Medical in the US. Uh, and on the right side, it's uh, Donny Hamilton, uh, who operates or who also works in Switzerland in the Swiss office. Uh, so it's great to see that we are still a family company and that is also part of the success. I believe part of the success because that makes decision decisions quick if needed. So if needed, you, you talk to the family, you talk to, to of course our people in, in Europe and then decisions can be made quick so we can react to what happens in the market. Uh, Hamilton is mostly known for, for medical devices, for ventilators, but that's only one part. And I want to show examples also from other areas. And one is Hamilton Robotics. Robotics is robotic liquid handling platforms uh, for transferring small volumes of liquids uh, in micro titer plates. Well, these platforms, these robots are used in clinical labs, in blood banks, in drug discovery, uh, in research, in, in ceramics. And one example also for that is, of course, uh, uh, PCR testing and PCR, most famous PCR or promotive t PCR testing today is uh, testing of COVID, COVID testing. And in fact, 60 to 70 percent of all automated COVID testing worldwide is done using Hamilton equipment, either by having a machine, a full robot of Hamilton uh, using that one, or to have a product of one of our OEM customers where our customers buy the critical components, liquid handling components, and embed that, build that into their systems. So it's an Hamilton inside, not whistle from outside. Uh, this makes us very proud that we also can contribute in this area. It was a big challenge because uh, the demand suddenly two, two years ago quickly rose because everyone, everybody suddenly wanted to test, especially as the testing started, PCR testing, everybody wanted to have our machine and instruments. So it was a big challenge to ramp up, so the production had to triple for instruments and components. Uh, and one example that was also very critical is this here. It's part of, of the robots. These are tips, uh, pipetting tips, 
uh, which are used for uh, diagnostics uh, research and also for the PCR setup. It's disposable tips. It's important that these are the disposable tips because that's the only way how you can avoid cross-contamination. If you have cross-contamination between different patient samples, you diagnose people who are COVID negative to be positive, and that needs to be avoided. But the challenge is suddenly everybody wanted to have these tips. And that is the reason why previously nobody knew about this product, but then suddenly it was in, in, in TV station, in the news, even in Tagesschau in Germany uh, and, and, and other newspapers, that this is really a bottleneck. And that required really a high effort from us. One thing is we, we doubled or we added more production lines in-house and our partners. But on the other side, our team went and analyzed all the databases that we had uh, and, and screened the customers. And the goal of Hamilton was to evenly distribute the samples according to their needs. But there were some very clever customers who said, I want to build my private stock. And each stock that you build means you can't test somewhere else. So we screened our databases, our install base. We looked how many systems do we have per, per, per customer. And then we estimated what's the need of that customer in the next four weeks. And then we did active allocation of these tips to our customers to make sure that as many customers can run their, their, their processes and analyzes as possible. Also a big challenge requiring a great team, doing great overtime, great work. Uh, and I'm really happy that we have such team. Already mentioned Hamilton Medical. It's maybe the most uh, known area of Hamilton. It's building ventilators for intensive care. Hamilton Medical was founded in 1968 in Switzerland. And the goal of Hamilton Medical was, the vision was to build a ventilator that is like an autopilot in an airplane. So the ventilator senses uh, the, some parameters in, in the patient, for example, uh, the oxygen level in the blood and then controls uh, that the ventilator adapts to the patient needs. That was the seed and the idea of ventilation. Uh, and now we have ventilators and now uh, in the last 24 months, one out of four ventilators worldwide was delivered by Hamilton. Uh, that was even a bigger challenge because after COVID, I think ventilation is one of the most uh, important treatments of uh, COVID patients in intensive care. Uh, everybody suddenly wanted to have ventilators uh, and within a couple of weeks we had a, a, a book, our order book was, was full. Uh, we had more orders than we usually produce in one year uh, and everybody wanted to have it now, uh, of course. And when it became really uh, also visible for all our employees, uh, when suddenly the Swiss Army landed in front of our building and took out the ventilators directly from our production line, to bring it to the hospitals. Uh, and that was then clear everybody, to everybody, now we have to, to work. And it was great because we get great, received great support from, from the local authorities. Within days, days, we had the allowance to do 24-7 operations or production, also at night on the weekends. Uh, also, we received great support by, by the national authorities. Uh, Northern Italy was, had a very, very hard lockdown in the beginning of the, of the phase. They were really heavily hit by COVID, uh, and they closed down everything. They closed down schools, shopping centers, and also all factories. And one of the factories they closed down was the factory building the housing elements for our ventilators. That means, hey, we can't produce anymore. So our CEO just took the phone, called in the Ministry of, of Economic Affairs in, in, in Bern, and then the minister himself replied quickly and said, hey, what's the problem? And then we described the problem. Hey, there's a factory in Italy. It's closed and we cannot open it because the CEO had, does not get any contacts. So this, the minister of Switzerland called the minister in Italy and made sure that this company reopens within two days to continue production uh, for our components. And we reused it often, this channel now, because then the deliveries were stopped because of, 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 of trade restrictions. Uh, then uh, uh, also other companies were closed, the supply chain was completely broken, so we really used that channel directly to the politics, and that is something that, why I was astonished, because I can imagine that it happened somewhere else on this level. That was the support, level of support we received from Switzerland, from the government, from the local authorities, that was unmatched for me up to this day. This is also a great achievement, that's now a picture from our US facility. It did not exist 24 months ago. 
When COVID started, we said, hey, the global demand is increasing like hell. We cannot produce everything out of Switzerland because you need to get the people, you need to get the, the equipment, you need to get the, the space. So for that, we anyway were lucky because we, we took a lot of people from, from the region, from other companies who had to send their people to short-time labor. Uh, and instead of sending them to short-time labor, they sent them, them to us to produce ventilators and uh, robots and tips. Um, and this is a picture uh, with Bob Hamilton here in the middle having the, uh, the 1,000th ventilator being produced on, on our new production line in Reno in the US. And within six months, the team uh, built up that from an empty hall to a fully certified production line for, for ventilators. And that is an achievement in parallel to ramping up the production in Switzerland. So that, that really reflects what, what great people we have, what level of people we have uh, to, to, to allow doing something like that. But of course, not only the people is a key factor, also a key factor is having the appropriate equipment. And we were lucky uh, that we invested into a new facility just two years before, prior to COVID. And part of that is also, now I need to see, I, maybe someone can click on it, it's a video. Uh, because it's, uh, yeah, now it starts, yeah, because we invested into new equipment. And that also includes this new uh, interlogistic systems that interconnects everything. So that interconnects the warehouse uh, with the production line, that interconnects the production lines with our test center, with final testing, with the warehouse. So people did not have to walk anymore to get all the equipment and the parts and components. Instead, it was also all delivered directly in the production line. And the finished ventilators were picked up by these robots uh, to bring it into the central warehouse. This eliminated the need for all the people to walk around. And we calculated it was 11,500 kilometers that these uh, small robots did last year for us before our employees had to walk that. Now, everybody can say, well, it was healthy walking. Yes, it is. But in prison, we also have 11,500 kilometers of, of hiking pathways through the mountains so they can do that on the weekend uh, and work really building ventilators while they are at work. So that's drove efficiency. Uh, in parallel, of, of course, we, we also built other automation equipment because automation is key to, to gain the quality level, always the same quality level, uh, and, 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 the, and, and also to, to, to uh, increase the efficiency in the production process. Uh, one area that is not that, that known, it's only known to specialists, is Hamilton Process Analytics. Uh, here we produce uh, sensors, sensors for uh, process industry. They are also used in bioreactors. And also here, the most known application is bioreactors for producing uh, COVID vaccines. And most of the European and US uh, COVID manufacturers use Hamilton sensors to monitor uh, critical values in the, during the, the, the fermentation and production process uh, online, in line. Um, this is also a video, maybe if you can start it. Uh, with these sensors, we did a step into the future because traditional sensors all have a cable and no real uh, features to, to sense, monitor and check. So we eliminated this old stuff and built a little device in there which is called our Arc technology that provides a Bluetooth interface that allows you to check the health status uh, and the condition of the sensor online by someone who is walking around. It still has a cable because it needs to be connected to the control system of the process. But to check the system, to monitor the system, to inspect the system, you have your application on your phone, on a tablet, or on your computer. And you can record uh, all the, the sensor data, the health status of the sensor, if it needs to be recalibrated, if it needs to exchange into a central database. That's very important for pharmaceutical production because you have to really keep track of everything that you are doing. It's written into a central database. You can, of course, then, then document it, sign it, and, and, and have it ready for inspection if someone comes. Uh, this is a very critical step that also increases the efficiency because you can check the health sense status of the sensor while it's still operating. With all other sensors, you need to remove them from the production process to check if it's still alive. Before I finish, also Hamilton Storage is one business unit that, that, that we have. We are producing here an automated storage system for biological or chemical substances. These systems are used in pharmaceutical industry uh, or in biobanks. 
uh, but also some of our customers still COVID, store COVID samples in these in the systems. But this is not what I want to refer. I want to uh, explain something about a new product that we launched here because that illustrates a little bit the mindset and the change of mindset of our customers as well. Uh, if you go into a lab, the way of using uh, expectations of the customers change. Uh, and the video that I show now is, is it's, it's, it's completely different than the videos we do usually because it, it addresses a different way of, oh, that was too far. Maybe one back. Here should be a video if you click in the black screen. Thank you. It's completely different than what we communicate today. Here you see, at, least, at first, it's about lifestyle. It's about lifestyle and, and the work-life balance of our customers gets more and more important. Uh, not only work, you need to balance work and life and ideally you want to check your systems, your equipment while you are somewhere in the mountains hiking because the repetitive stuff, the boring stuff, the, all the stuff that can be automated should run automatically. And once that's done, you want to be in the office, everything is ready, you want to get a message, hey, everything is ready. You want to monitor these processes, you want to be informed if something goes wrong. And if you get such a message, then you go into the company and check, hey, what's going on? In this case, he still enjoys his, his, his way to work from where he lives down to our company. Uh, and once he is there, he can start with his work. It was quite interesting when we launched this product uh, at a conference. Uh, there was a, a really a, a gap between those who are experienced and are 30, 40 years in a lab, so usually they're 50 years and older. Uh, they, they, they saw us with a tablet using, uh, operating the system, and they were fascinating. Wow, that's cool, that's new technology. And then suddenly the young people came, and then we also showed uh, this instrument. They did not even realize what's special on it because it's just standard. It's just natural that you use everything with your phone. And that really illustrates and demonstrates the gap between the generations. And everybody who, who, who develops new products needs to be aware that the young generation uses and operates the systems in a completely different manner than the people that have a lot of experience. Well, from here, I think that's the ideal start for a discussion. Thanks a lot. Sit there in the middle. In, in the middle. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Martin Frey. Yeah, you may uh, sit there. And sorry again for making you CEO already, but you know, <laughs> looking into the future. <laughs> All right, so I think that was a really, really great presentation, and we will dive deeper into uh, some topics now in our panel. But let me first welcome our two other panelists. So, um, to talk about the smart factory use cases, I would like to welcome Marvin Thiele. He is the CTO and co founder of Vicens, or Vicens in German. <laughs> um, he is a student, you may sit here, sorry, I'm standing on the wrong place. He's a, uh, actually a student at the Hasso Plattner Institute in Potsdam, currently pursuing his master degree and just uh, I think a month before the th thesis is ready so nice to have you here I know it's a very stressful situation at the moment um, but he founded a startup Vicenz one year ago out of both uh, out of university in both countries in Switzerland and Germany so nice to have you here and welcome this is your applause <laughs> But you know, we are nearly used to it already in those times we're having a hybrid event. So one of our panelists is also here uh, virtually on a digital remote connection. And I'd like to welcome Dr. Domenico Recchi. Welcome to you. Hello, Anja. I hope you can hear me well. Yes, and we greetings can. greetings from Switzerland, actually. Exactly. He is the head of Smith's Smart Factory in the Switzerland Innovation Park, Biel Bien. And before that, he worked actually here at the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence in Kaiserslautern for seven years, where he also got his PhD. So he's German, but moved to Switzerland four years ago. And uh, Martin uh, just said that he moved because of the mountains. Did you also move beca because of the mountains? <laughs> I think the mountains are a good reason to, to come here. I really enjoy the nature and the, the beauty of the Swiss, Swiss landscapes. Um, but to be honest, it was not the mountains that brought me here. Mm -hmm. It was a unique opportunity. Uh, as you mentioned, um, I work for the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence. Uh, I was in a lucky position that I 
was uh, 2011 in the team of Professor Zürke and Professor Walster, uh, the two gentlemen that uh, are very much connected to the success story of Industry 4.0. By the way, a concept that has become world famous and it has been developed in Europe. Um, that's something we should uh, always keep in mind that um, Europe has brought forward such an important um, concept, exported it to many, many other countries. And, you know, at that time, um, we introduced uh, the fourth industrial revolution, the, the ideas um, in Kaiserslautern in our center by developing first demonstrators, running first projects. And to be honest, we had a hard time to convince the industry about this concept in the first two years. But um, it, it changed suddenly. And then we had big players joining us and we had bigger initiatives and bigger projects that uh, realized the tremendous potential behind the fourth industrial revolution and connecting all these different technologies that come with the internet of things with artificial intelligence with cyber physical systems and so on mm -hmm. so i was a young um, researcher there and um, i could take over a few projects and when i uh, finished my phd i stayed there for two years to um, be in the co-lead of the research department but at some point, you know, I wanted to move on. And it was a big coincidence that I met with a professor for, from Switzerland that uh, just pointed me out, you know, in Switzerland, they're planning to build a smart factory, a place where industry and research can collaborate on all of these ideas that um, span around the fourth industrial revolution. And I was actually hesitant to really um, go forward with this um, application. But then, um, yeah, one evening I, I sent the application and I was immediately uh, invited and welcomed to Switzerland. And I came here to the city of Biel and uh, someone showed me what they are planning and I was immediately convinced about the potential that we have here. And I was convinced um, about um, that this is a great place for innovation because Switzerland itself is, is, is beautiful, of course, but it's also uh, bringing you a lot of opportunities. Everything is close by. It's, it's so condensed. You find so much industry in, 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 in such a small um, area. Yeah. And uh, then you have fantastic universities as well. So uh, I think it was a good decision to come here. And by now I'm here almost five years and very glad. <laughs> And now this, you are not having a virtual background uh, here on this Zoom call. This is actually a real background because we are talking here about smart factory use cases and you are actually standing in the smart uh, Swiss, Smith, Swiss smart factory. This is a really difficult one. Um, yeah, so yes. can you maybe show us around a little bit? Yeah, yes, of course. Actually, uh, three weeks ago, we had the grand opening. Um, we have been uh, before somewhere else in a, in a much smaller facility to start and practice. But now we have the honor to be here in the center of the city of Biel, just right to the station of Biel, uh, where we have 1,000 square meter laboratory. And we have here a use case um, yeah, with machines and robots and modules um, and also presentation facilities. Um, and it's it, it's it's quite quite a nice space to, to play around and to show um, yeah how production of future can look like. What we do actually we use uh, drones, customized drones. Uh, this is is one of them. You know, it's a bit uh, a toy for us, <laughs> but the, the the product itself is not the the main aspect. We want to show how can we use the advanced technologies to produce in a smarter way from the customer order that is completely individualized uh, to yeah, delivering the product to the customer, not only with um, yeah, satisfaction of having a wonderful product, but also with, for example, additional information like the CO2 footprint, how much CO2 has been uh, produced while producing the product. You know, yeah. I think that are also things uh, that we have to look at and that we are addressing here yeah. um, in our factory. So sustainability Perfect. and circular economy uh, also, these are strong values um, that very well fit into this Swiss ecosystem. Very nice. Thank you very much, Dominic, for now uh, showing us your toy here. Let's talk about another toy. It's obviously not a toy, but Vicens. What is Vicens doing? Yes, so 
Uh, we are a small startup, Switzerland-based startup, and we have been founded a year ago where we had a development project with BMW and the two universities. And from this project, then the thing evolved and then turned into a little startup. And what we do is a combination of a hardware and software system in order to give you remote insights into your industrial production machines, and especially into the errors of them. So you can imagine if you have a normal machine and an error happens, you maybe see a small message which indicates the problem. But with vSense installed, you get a lot of camera perspectives, you get sensor data, and you get everything you need, just the amount of data which you really need to solve the incident. And after a lot of time, if your machine is fixed up and you have found all the errors, you can just take the system and put it on some other machine and therefore improve your production iteratively. And this also goes into the same similar direction as the Hamilton smart sensors and as we, the arc sensor, as we saw, in order to get more digital insight into your production. Mm. So. That sounds actually very easy, <laughs> but I assume you're very uh, overcoming a very big challenges uh, for the companies. What kind of companies are are using that? Are taking uh, the advantages? Yeah, so currently we are working with automotive companies yeah. because we see a lot of change in their machines. It's often that they produce something for a year and then they switch something up. For example, a new model comes out and then they need to change the machines. And every time you ramp up machines, it creates a lot of new errors. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you need to investigate these in order to ramp up your production quicker. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the use cases which you're working on. Okay. Is this something that would be something for Hamilton? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I think that's, that's <laughs> interesting. And it, it's really essential that, y that you have close monitoring of your machines and you, you can react quickly. Because each machine that, that stops production is, in the end, lost revenue in good times and, and uh, died people yeah. in bad times. Definitely. So there can be a little business chat later uh, during our Apovo, maybe. Um, but uh, Marvin, just again, so you found this company in both countries, right? In Switzerland and in Germany. Why? And uh, yeah, just explain a little bit. And, and why actually also in Switzerland? Yeah, of course. So um, the team consists of two Swiss people and me, the German guy. Okay. And uh, <laughs> therefore... <laughs> How's that going? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it was quite natural for us to found in Switzerland. But there are many advantages in Switzerland, being, for example, the close contact to the uh, local authorities in order to help us um, in our business to get more customers and to get some PR and some marketing. And there has been very close support with the local um, office, for example, in Schaffhausen. And this created a lot of great opportunities for us. Is that something that you see as well? Because you've uh, just mentioned in your presentation that you uh, invested in this really big new factory, I think, two years ago. Um, is it something that you said, okay, we're definitely doing that here in, in Switzerland, in this uh, location? Absolutely. We are committed to this location. And we just started the, the groundworks for, third for the next building okay. because we, we continue the expansion path. Uh, that's the reason. I think you, you have highly skilled people. You have the uh, I excellent infrastructure. Uh, you have everything that you need to do business. Uh, of course, we have also other locations. Uh, but each time we, we went somewhere to another location, like Romania, we, we never reduced people in Switzerland. No. Switzerland is just growing. Uh, and I think this combination of this, this infrastructure, this, this, this mindset and of the people in Switzerland, in combination, of course, with an international world, uh, is the ideal setup. Mm -hmm. Ideal setup is also um, in the Swiss smart factory. So, Dominic, um, just tell us quickly, like, what kind of opportunities do, company, do companies have when they come to you? So, first of all, uh, we are a test and demonstration laboratory. So, our partners are usually uh, technology providers for factories, um, ranging from IoT sensors, um, robotics, um, yeah, also uh, IT providers. And we have here some sort of a demilitarized zone. So we have even competitive companies that uh, work together with us, integrate our technology and see and learn how the technology works. And um, then also use it as an exploitation platform. Um, bring their partners, bring their clients to us and uh, show them, give them a feeling for technology. We, we, we think, you know, it's better to touch the technology than just to um, showcase it on a PowerPoint. And that can really be experienced here. So I think that's a, a big uh, value that we offer to the companies. Of course, we do a lot of networking in between of them. And also we support these companies to maybe develop the, the next generation of technologies by, for example, 
addressing um, joint research projects on the European Union level or on the national level here in Switzerland together with the InnoSwiss grants. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's actually quite a lot that we do for the companies and it's also for us clear that um, we discuss the uh, roadmap for each company individually. So um, you come to us, you become a partner and we decide for, okay, what, what, what are our goals for the next one and a half or two years? And then we try to set this into, into place. Marvin and, and, and Martin, is this also something that you are using a lot in Switzerland, like networks? Uh, do you get to know like other entrepreneurs? Is there like a strong network that you're using? Yes, networks are important. Networks are important for everything that you do because not, it's not only you who have the expertise. We work with a lot of companies in, in the close region. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's great. You can get everything in the close region that, that you need from, from machine manufacturers to uh, R&D companies. Uh, 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 also from, from all levels uh, and I think that that's essential to have this network to really always use the people that you need. But is it because of like also the, the, the short distances and, and you talked earlier about having the direct line to the minister, I mean this is something I think very special or do you say okay this is very um, an advantage we have in Switzerland? It's an advantage. Yeah. It's an advantage because the short distances just allow you, of course now we do Zoom calls and everything, we also do that. But, but in the end, if, if, if something is really critical, you want to sit down and, s and see what's, mm. what's, what's, what's going on. Yeah. Uh, and that is the case where the short distance is good. I, if the partner is somewhere in, 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 in the US or in Eastern Europe or somewhere else, then you need to plan for it. It's a week until you can meet. And if it's close by, then you just say, hey, sit in a car and we just meet in 30 minutes. Yeah. And, and that's a big advantage. And, and then, of course, also with the people that you have. It's just one comparison I just thought about. If you set up a production line, the, the type of production line is different. We produce, produce the same products in the US and in Switzerland mm. uh, with the same parts, but the production process is set up differently. Okay. In Switzerland, we follow the, 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 the principle that, that a product is built by one person from beginning to end mm. and then handed over to a second person for final inspection. In the US, US we, we can't do that. We yeah. don't have the skill set of the people that can't uh, do the full process from beginning to end. So we split the process into micro steps and everybody does his single step. Mm -hmm. That needs by far more documentation, by far more testing, by far more inspection uh, than someone who is made reliable or liable for this product. In the end, he puts a signature below yeah. it and he feels responsible for it, that it works in the end. And that also is key factor for quality uh, and, and also making the production and, and, and the output efficient, even if you have, have, have people that maybe, okay, salaries are high, everybody knows that, but, but the, what you get for it mm. is also better than somewhere else. Marvin is nodding the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. And I also would add the familiarity between the companies in Switzerland. For example, we have a customer in Schaffhausen where we are also sitting. And I think it always creates like a good bond between the companies if yeah. they are from the same city or from the same canton. And since Switzerland is a bit smaller, it like creates this familiarity aspect to it. And I think that's also really important in supply chain things. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's uh, still one or two minutes for a question out of the audience. Is there a question from one of you? Um, also, maybe our online audience. Can I actually ask questions? <laughs> they can't. Okay, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, they can. They can ask questions. Perfect. So if uh, you online have a question, then please uh, you can also type it in. But is there a question to one of our panelists? Not at the moment. I think we've been pretty clear there with everything uh, we said. I hope so. Or do I see a lot of question marks? Yes, Daniel. <laughs> um, hold on, we're coming with the microphone. Yes. Maybe something that uh, was mentioned from everybody here. Thank you for the very nice uh, presentation and introduction. Um, you all mentioned like it was difficult to introduce new innovation like to your customers and to the workforce. So what are your concepts or recipes to, 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 uh, to tackle that situation? It, it always depends on what innovation you, you present. I think there is this kind of innovation where everybody is waiting for. Uh, that is a lucky punch. Uh, what, what we had with the ventilators. That is a lucky punch. Uh, but then there is this kind of innovation. If you are really on the, on the top edge of, of development and innovation, you develop something 
sometimes something that not yet has an application. Uh, and people need to learn how to use it and, and develop. For example, if you go to volume slow in, in pipetting, they become smaller and smaller, and then you can go into volumes of, of nanoliters. And, and today, there is not really an application for it, but everybody knows uh, the ten tendency is going to lower volumes. So someone has to make a start. It's the chicken and egg problem. Uh, is the technology here at first, or is the application here at first? Once the technology is there, people will use it. Not thousands in the beginning, but they will start to use this, develop applications, and then it can be a success. But if nobody develops a technology, you will never have a success because you can't do the applications. Thank you. So um, just to wrap up the panel really quickly, one last last words um, from all of you. So where is the, where's your vision? Where does, there you go to, um, what's next? So Dominic, would you like to start? Yes, I uh, think for us it's just an exciting time. We just have um, yeah, marked the milestone with the inauguration of the new building and the new facility. And uh, now we're going to yeah, build on top of that. Um, we are now very active in European Union projects, connecting to actors all over Europe and actually all over the world. And uh, our network is growing. So um, the next steps, we will look very much forward to that, yes. Network is growing, so and everybody can be part of it, right? <laughs> if they want to. That's absolutely the case, yes. You have a question? How can I invest in your company and uh, what is the minimum invest? <laughs> How can I invest in your company and what's the minimum and invest? I already repeated it for the microphone. And what do you think about the crypto uh, currencies? That's a company. <laughs> This, this question is, is it pointed to us or yeah, pointed to, who to, to, you, to, to, to Marvin to, uh, or who do you direct this question to? Marvin. To the investors. Well, investors, and they are. Sorry. Yeah, well, then the investors, they are watching online. So, uh, <laughs> but I'm sure, can you invest in your business? Uh, yes, so we're currently doing a funding round, so you come at a very opportune <laughs> time. <laughs> <laughs> so, very good. So, what's your vision then? <laughs> and yeah, so our next? vision is, of course, to um, take the error resolutions and companies to the next level and to come from simple error messages and undigitalized machines to a more industry 4.0 like machines where they're all connected and you can see all the data all the time. Yeah. Perfect. And last but not least, I mean, COVID is still there, unfortunately, but not as bad for your company. So um, what, is, what is next? What, uh, what is your vision? The next, maybe also for this answer, you can't invest in our company. It's family owned. <laughs> 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 and that's good. Um, but uh, the vision, I think the vision in the lab area is, is interconnection. That, that's clear. I think that's yeah. a tendency everybody now, especially during times of COVID, people learn to work from home. And you had empty uh, uh, lab spaces, but the machines still should, should run. And I think that time was a very important time where we see we are not there. We are still not there. We still need the operator loading the, the samples. We need, still need the operator loading the, the, the tips. And, and the vision is that everything should run on its own. And that is what customers want to have. And that's, that's still a big step to go that we also get in all areas, also for consumers, the, the level of reliability that it can work 24-7 and only once a week an operator comes and refills everything that you need. Well, best of luck to all of you. Thank you very much for this uh, quick and brief and short panel here. A uh, very big applause. Thank you. So, but it's not over. As I said, we're going to have one more presentation and one more panel. So I'd now like to welcome back again on stage Raymond Kron, the CEO of Switzerland Innovation. Thank you very much, uh, Anja. Thank you. So, you already heard from the previous speakers, uh, Marvin, Martin, and my colleague uh, Dominic Gorecki, uh, why Switzerland is a great place to work, but also to live. And I would like to, to put this now a little bit in context and provide you with an overview on Switzerland as a global innovation champion and also provide you with some background uh, about uh, Switzerland innovation. 
Here you see uh, some information uh, dealing with the powerhouse Switzerland in the center of Europe. I, was, I would like to point out some uh, aspects. Uh, firstly, Switzerland is for the 10th consecutive year now the champion of the Global Innovation Index. This is one of the indexes uh, measuring the innovation uh, performance of a country. And Switzerland is now for the 10th years on the top of this ranking. One element. Another key element <coughs> is the positioning of our Swiss universities. I take the example of ETH Zurich and uh, EPFL in Lausanne. These are the two federal institutes uh, of technology. Both universities are global champions uh, in their field. Uh, they are top ranked, for, for instance, in the QS uh, ranking, uh, which is a global ranking for universities. And the innovation performance of a country depends very much of the universities and the educational system in this country, and therefore our universities and our educational system is one of the strengths of Switzerland as a, an innovation location. Switzerland has the world's highest patent rate per, per capita. And so we have per capita the most patent <coughs> registrations worldwide. And the last figure, if you look at the PhD rate in Switzerland, it's also one of the highest in the world. Uh, and this is another, uh, another element, another aspect which proves uh, the innovation power of our country. Now, uh, looking at the Swiss map, you see on this uh, slide the innovation ecosystem of Switzerland, or a part of the innovation ecosystem of Switzerland. You see the six uh, parks of Switzerland innovation and the 16 sites which are belonging to these six parks. Every white dot is a, is a site of, of Switzerland innovation. You see that this is a network which covers the, the whole flat area of Switzerland, all three re li linguistic regions of Switzerland, and you don't need more than two hours to travel from the very eastern part to the very western parts. And this shows uh, the proximity we have in our, in our country. Uh, you see as well on this slide uh, our academic partners, the universities on the one hand, the universities of applied science on the other hand, but also the research organizations like the Paul Scherer Institute or EMPA, which are also globally leading research organizations. And through this uh, collaboration between Switzerland Innovation and the academic partners, we create breeding grounds uh, for innovation, meaning that at Switzerland Innovation, at the Swiss Innovation Park, you find idle framework conditions as an innovative entrepreneur to promote and accelerate your innovation projects. Dominic Gorecki, you saw just before, is working at the Switzerland Innovation Park BLBN. You see it in the middle, and the Swiss Smart Factory is installed uh, at this park. Now, our credo as Switzerland Innovation is that there are two ingredients for successful uh, innovation projects. The first one is collaboration, and the second one is the concept of open innovation. And therefore, uh, we try to form an ecosystem which allows researchers from universities and innovative entrepreneurs to work together on the platforms we are creating and offering in order to jointly develop research results into marketable products and services. That's, that's one key element of the implementation of our credo. Uh, the other uh, element is that we are providing direct access to our leading Swiss universities for innovative entrepreneurs from all over the world. Switzerland Innovation is open to all uh, companies from all over the world, for all research teams from companies coming from all over the world. And one uh, interesting element of Switzerland Innovation is that we are a typical PPP initiative. Uh, when Switzerland Innovation was launched in 2016, 
politics, academia and the private sector joined forces and created this initiative of Switzerland Innovation. We benefit from a strong mandate of our federal government and this is, is a, a, an important sales argument, especially when we are on the road uh, in foreign countries. L let me, uh, after concluding, before concluding, give you some, some uh, information why Switzerland and Switzerland innovation are, interest are an interesting place for innovation projects and innovative entrepreneurs. I think we, we can bring uh, three main assets uh, to the table. The first one is the academic excellence of our Swiss universities, which means at the same time that we are able to attract the best talents from all over the world. And if you would like to be on the top of innovation, then you need to be able to work with the best talents from all over the world and therefore this uh, cap capability to attract these talents is, is key. Uh, if you look at the PhD community at Swiss universities, they're, they, this community is very international, roughly 50% of the PhD students are coming from abroad. Second asset is the, the vibrant ecosystem of startups we have in Switzerland. In Switzerland you, fi you find really a vibrant uh, community of startups. I always compare Switzerland with the Silicon Valley. Size-wise, the flat area of Switzerland is more or less, uh, has more or less the same size as the Silicon Valley and the ecosystem of startups in Switzerland is also comparable. And the third asset is the fact that in Switzerland you find many global corporates uh, which are operating important R&D activities in Switzerland. If you take companies like uh, Roche, Novartis, Nestle, ABB, these are companies which are headquartered in Switzerland. They are running important R&D activities, but if you take, for instance, also Google, Google's second largest research center in the world is in Zurich. Why is it in Zurich? Be because Google decided they have to be in Zurich because they wanted to be in close proximity with ETH Zurich. So the academic excellence, the ecosystem of startups and the existence of many big companies running important R&D activities in Switzerland, these are the three assets Switzerland can bring to the table if you as an innovative entrepreneur uh, consider uh, continuing your innovation projects in Switzerland. And of course, Switzerland Innovation helps you uh, in setting up your project or your company in Switzerland. We, we act as a one-stop shop for you. We provide you an idle infrastructure, be it office space or lab space. These are some uh, uh, background information ab about Switzerland. Uh, the, the previous speakers uh, witnessed uh, uh, about uh, Switzerland's qualities as a pl place to live, but also as a place to innovate. And uh, therefore, we are very happy to welcome you in Switzerland and at Switzerland Innovation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Raymond Kahn, um, for the invitation as well. And uh, now we know where all the Switzerland innovation parks are located. We want to get to know three more representatives from the parks in Zurich, Innovare and Basel. And we will have another short panel now. So between now and the apero, there is the panel. So one last time, all your... Um, Aufmerksamkeit, all your attention, that's the English word for that. Um, and uh, we are going to talk about composites and additive manufacturing. So we will have a deeper look, a deeper tech dive now into uh, innovation and its outcomes and hear free use cases from our representatives. First, I welcome you on stage Michael Wüthrich. He um, is working as a senior lecturer in development of mechatronical products at the Institute of Mechatronic Systems at the Zurich University of Applied Science in Winterthur. Welcome, hello. <laughs> Uh, 
And up next, Daniel Seiler. He leads the Medical Additive Manufacturing Group at the Institute for Medical Engineering and Medical Informatics at the University of Applied Science and Arts, Northwestern Switzerland. Welcome also to our panel. You may sit there. And um, also, yes. <laughs> And again, on a remote connection, we welcome Dr. Christian Grünzweig. He is the CEO of Anaxam, Anaxam, the National Technology Transfer Center at the Switzerland Innovation Park in Innovare. And he actually also studied here close to Stuttgart in Tübingen, I saw, and at the ETH Zürich, and has been working as a scientist at the Paul Scherer Institute for more than 10 years. Welcome, nice to have you here with us. Good evening. Welcome, everybody. So let me actually um, start with you uh, directly, uh, Christian Grünzweig. So Anaxam, what does it, uh, we can read it in the background as well. Um, so what does it stand for? Who is behind it? What is it? Anaxam is like Haribo in German. Most people do not know that it's an abbreviation. So <laughs> Anaxam also is an abbreviation that stands for analytics with neutrons and x-rays for advanced manufacturing. So hold on, did you say Haribo is an acronym for something? I didn't really didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, it's Hans, it's Hans Riegel Bonn. Ah, right, we've learned something today. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, um, so what kind of industries uh, benefit from, from working with you or from, from, from Anaxam and, and who is working with Anaxam? Yes, maybe first a few words what Anaxam is doing. Um, we at the end provide industry access to so-called advanced analytical um, methods based with so-called neutrons and synchrotron radiation. Um, our slogan is a bit like materials analytic way beyond laboratory scale and why we claim way beyond laboratory scale. Because what we're actually doing, and uh, we already heard this word today at the Paul Scherer Institute, we most likely provide industry access to this analytical techniques that has in previous times developed for researchers scientists did it and we would like to let industry now profit from such analytics maybe to just give you a number these machines what we are using they're really um, football sized um, we have for instance when we talk about x-rays which people know when you go to hospitals or even nowadays standing outside in industry we talk about 10 billion so 10 million mile so 10 billions more flux photons that we can provide for our investigation that means we have a lot of much more light and that moves the analytics to a completely new field for instance, what we will talk today about additive manufacturing or composites materials. So beside these two branches, in principle, we are open to any industrial customer who has needs of doing analytics. We always say what we would like to do to move the boundaries of what is nowadays feasible compared to the lab-based analytics. Okay, thank you so much. And I think you also uh, brought us a picture to have a look, a closer look at those facilities that are as big as football fields. Yes, I think we can still hear you when you're talking. Yes. Yes, <laughs> yes, we can. <laughs> yes, no problem. So in principle, what you see right here is the so-called Paul Scherer Institute. Uh, right in the north is already uh, Baden-Württemberg. It's a bit an older picture because the Park Innovare, which is uh, left to the end, um, is currently to be built. That's the Park Innovare, uh, the hub uh, in, in Filligen in the Canton Algau. And just to give you an example, when we say uh, far beyond laboratory scale, so the N is in principle, and the X is where the synchrotron slash X-ray source is. So uh, beside the dimensions of the, the machines um, makes us, let's say, um, a step above what is uh, known on the laboratory scale. Just to give you an, an, a feeling about what the machine dimensions are. Mm. Thank you so much. It's, I think it's very incredible to see, see the, the size of that uh, facility. So thank you so much. Um, Michael, you are, uh, your main focus is the development of new um, technologies in, in ma additive manufacturing. What exactly do you develop? Well, uh, as a University of Applied Sciences, we, we always try to be very innovative, for sure. And we see where weaknesses are in, in additive manufacturing. Uh, one, one recent thing we did is trying to um, 
I don't know who knows a little bit about additive, additive manufacturing. You always have these support structures, which is, is really a, a pain. And we tried to build a new printer, which is able to print totally without um, support structures. It was first a bachelor thesis. It was developed by students. They are very, you know, they were very innovative. They found really a, a new way to do it. And now we have a printer. Uh, which really is able to print without support material. Unfortunately, now we need an industrial partner. We are not able to, to build a, a product. For sure, we could do a startup, but the students, they wanted, uh, <laughs> they didn't want to do it by themselves. Uh -huh. So we need, unfortunately, and I can't do it by myself. I don't have the time for it. So we now need industrial partners to, as all our ideas, we, we somehow to bring them out, we need partners. We cannot do it by by ourselves. Yeah. Right, so that's something you're looking for right now. Yeah, great. Um, Daniel Seiler, um, you are also um, in the field of additive manufacturing, however, um, a, a bit different. What is your area of research or your area of what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, well, thank you very much. Um, I'm uh, leading a laboratory where we have installed several different technolo te technologies in the field of additive manufacturing, like 3D printing where we do applied research on new materials, new processes to create uh, the next generation of, of implants. And there we um, work on different projects uh, very close together with industry, uh, med tech companies, but also clinicians on the other side to uh, bring these technologies into the, the patients basically mm. in the end. Um, you've sent me a presentation before which was incredible because I think it's it's just amazing what is possible to do with additive manufacturing. I'm not sure, did you bring a picture or a presentation? No, um, unfortunately okay. that didn't uh, make good. it to the screen, but um, <laughs> yeah. All good. No, welcome otherwise. to visit the website. <laughs> yes, I would definitely uh, recommend you that because it's, it's just incredible. Um, so is, is medical um, also your focus or what, what um, with your... 3D printers um, that you develop, what, what kind of areas um, do you Well, basically it's all into. areas where you, yeah. where you can use 3D printing. Um, it's we, f we in our group, we only focus on, on plastics. We don't focus on, on metal or ceramics or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's just plastic, so it's a, a little bit uh, specific, but basically it's you can do everything with it. Oh, not everything, but... People think you can do everything with, with additive manufacturing. That's not really true. You can do a lot, but not everything. But we, as I said, we, we focus on, on plastics, we focus on, on developing new machines, and we also focus, focus on new processes. So, so what can you do, what can you do, which cannot be done now? And so, for example, we try to, to do, to build the first fully FDM 3D printed electrical motor. And we succeeded, everything is printed except uh, the electronics that um, uh, that's you could also print it, but it's, it's, uh, we're not there yet. But the, the coil and the magnets and everything is printed. So yeah. and it's, it's really turning, it, it, it works, yeah. That's so interesting. Can you go a bit deeper into what exactly you're printing and what, what are the challenges? What is your, your day-to-day uh, <laughs> business, basically? Yeah, well, um, maybe I have to go a bit further back. When I started like working in, in the industry, I started developing implants for, for well-known um, companies. So I spent like 15 years doing that. And I was more and more like a bit uh, concerned about the patient in the end because the paperwork grows. Uh, like I, I felt much more far away from the patient from year to year. And then I, I saw this, this absolutely fascinating technology of additive manufacturing and how, and how it could be used to individualize uh, products, especially uh, um, implants for, for, a, for a patient. So uh, like four years ago, I had the chance to, to, to take over this uh, research group. Mm -hmm. And there we uh, have like a vision and also working on a process. It's not only additive, additive manufacturing itself, it's a digital process chain in the end, where we work from CT scan um, to uh, over uh, designing new uh, implants individualized on patients and then uh, produce them with, with the help of additive manufacturing. 
and bring them individualized uh, into the, the OR in the end. And currently we're even working on processes that we're going to install directly inside the hospital. So it's a complete game changer in the future. So the, the, there's, uh, there's now uh, the, op the, the, uh, the opportunity to, to uh, actually uh, design and manufacture the, the implant specifically for a single patient within the hospital and therefore reduce um, like delivery times and also have then better um, clinical outcomes in the end. Yeah, thank you. So um, Michael said that he's looking for companies um, to work with. Why should companies work together with you? I think there are, as, as we already heard, we have a, a huge expertise. Uh, we are in the Zurich University of Applied Sciences. We have many institutes. We have specialists for almost every field. We work, institutes work together. So I think we have, we have labs, we have uh, a lot of um, masquerade, a lot of lab equipment. We can, we can do really a lot of things. And in, in Switzerland, and there is also a lot of um, funding for, for projects from the government, uh, what we can do. And I think it's, if you, if you, if you have an idea and you're not able to, to develop it, we can help you mm. develop it. And we also have the possibility to do the really crazy stuff I like to do with <laughs> the students huh? because they, have, they, they, uh, they are very inno innovative mostly. They, some, some of them, not mostly, <laughs> but they are, <laughs> well, it's, a lot of them are very innovative and they have, they have time in their bachelor thesis to go totally new, new ways, ways yeah. to think totally new things. And I, I really like the, the opportunities we have also with the students. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Christian, why should uh, c uh, companies uh, come to you and work together with you? Can you also do crazy stuff with them? <laughs> I guess so, with 10 billion more photons than on a lab-based system. Um, I guess they can clearly profit. Just to give you an example, when you do 3D printing, um, it's different to the past. What has people done like casting? When you cast something, you have a melt and the heat that goes in, in every direction out. When you do 3D printing, it's often depending what exactly happens at the spot when you melt the material. So for instance, what we can do, um, we have built a small um, 3D printing machine that we can install at our synchrotron and we can look with our beam to see live what kind of so-called phases are forming during the 3D printing. We can also see how the powder flies away. So as due to the amount of light what we have, we can look in principle live what happens during a 3D printing process, just as one of the example. And this can help people to, let's say, either companies who build the printer, this could be companies who are building um, parts that could also be in collaboration, what we do with the University of Applied Science, um, that we can look together and further use this analytical capabilities, what you don't get on a lab system to further improve the processes itself. Or for instance, um, if you go a bit bigger and you have printed something, often due to internal stresses and strains, the part at the end is maybe slightly tilted or bended and whatever. And this is again due to the, the stresses. And we can, for instance, measure such stresses. Or at the end, if you have the final product, you feed an, an, an input parameter into machine because you say it should be at the end the teeth that should comes out with this dimensions and shape. We can do at the end the inspection to check if the real the component is coming out what you have in your hand, what you ideally would have fitted in into the machine to be printed. So there's a lot of analytical capabilities, what you can do. Um, I just talked about x-rays. You can even to use neutrons. They are actually not available on the laboratory scale. So that's a completely new um, system what you can use. So definitely some crazy stuff that we can do with you. And now we've lost him, unfortunately. But I think he was finished anyway. Um, so. And Daniel, then the question also to you. What, how can, ah, there he's back. But did you want to add something, Sorry. Christian? Sorry, you just um, dropped, or were you done anyway? Yes, it looks like I lost briefly the connection. I don't know where I was lost, but. Uh, <laughs> it sounded like you were in the end of the sentence, so. <laughs> yes. 
Um, and Daniel, how can how can companies benefit from working with you, and how can they do that? Yeah, I, I think in previous uh, presentations it's alway, already came out. It's uh, also on our side. It's about uh, the network, and uh, we are very much focused on the application, on the clinical application, and to improve like the quality for the patient in the end. So we have this whole process chain of different uh, technologies, mm -hmm. and when it, for example, comes to a, a better understanding of the of the additive manufacturing process, as Christian mentioned it just now, we work closely with with uh, with institutes like like Anaxam to understand the process better, and then finally improve the quality of of an implant um, out of that uh, analytics mm -hmm. option. On the other hand, we are, we are very close with the University of Applied Sciences. We very close collaborate with the industry, with local industry, with the European industry, also globally with the global players. So we very have a, a very close collaboration with those and we try to understand their problems uh, and, 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 on, and then also help them to innovate uh, for the next uh, uh, stage of, of uh, pro generation of products. But also what I, what I see and makes me proud is uh, through education. So in, in my lab, we also run uh, projects with students. We also put that uh, knowledge into, into the teach teaching. And now more and more I see uh, alumni from, from our institute uh, coming up, coming back yeah. uh, to our institute and asking, asking for help. So it's that's really nice to see. Yeah, yeah that's very good. So mm, I think it's, it's, it's just great what I earlier said, what, what can be done. So do you see the medical future definitely also more and more using additive manufacturing? How do you see that? Yeah, there's a c at the moment a very controversial, controversial uh, discussion about uh, that uh, application of additive manufacturing. I'm also critical about putting uh, everything into the digital uh, chain so that at the end an algorithm will decide how the implant will look like. That's also concepts we're working on. But I think at the moment we have to do that step, we have to go, we have to get to know how it, how it works. And of course there's the other very conservative side of uh, implant manufacturers who don't really believe in this technology. Mm -hmm. But then there's also the others. So mm -hmm. at the moment we'll see what's going to happen. But I think it's going to change a lot in the future. Yeah. yeah, a lot of change. I would like to give the opportunity to you if you have a question to one of our panelists, then now would be the time. always difficult after one and a half hours listening right I know well it doesn't seem like it I, I can see in your faces that you are longing for a good glass of Swiss wine um, <laughs> which I tried a lot in the, <laughs> in the past weeks here so I could definitely recommend that um, with regards to the time I would say for now we the rest of the conversation we will be having uh, over there at our uh, Aperu place uh, unfortunately Christian I'm very sorry that you can't be part of it uh, open yourself a nice bottle of wine but I'd like to say thank you very much for being here online and also thank you to the two of you for being here this is your applause thank you thank you, thank you for the opportunity <laughs> I'm just looking if is there anything else you would like to say from from Britta's side or or do I just invite everyone over there now <laughs> Okay, all right. And thank you so much for coming, for listening. And um, yeah, we'll see each other at the bar. Thanks. <laughs>